So welcome everybody uh, to week five of our Sharks for Kids Jossum webinar series. Uh, my name is Jillian Morris. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids. And today we have an amazing talk uh, with Dr. Stephen Majura talking about shark super senses. Now, if you've been watching, you've heard us talk about a variety of species, their diversity, uh, and these animals can do some pretty amazing things because of their super powered senses. Um, Dr. Kajira is a professor at Florida Atlantic University. You've probably seen him on TV shows. If you're, if you're in Florida, you've definitely seen him on the news talking about shark related um, different issues, incidents, things like that. Um, and also, if you've ever seen aerial footage of the black tips off Florida, um, when there's hundreds of sharks swimming around, um, he is the scientist that actually gets to go up in the airplane and the helicopters to study that, which I think is really incredible. So you might be familiar with his work. So thank you guys again, everyone who's joining us. And remember to put your questions in the Q&A and I'm gonna turn it over to you. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kajara. All right, thank you so much. Let me see if I can get this to, uh, to play now. Let's see if I do this and share and play. Can you see that? You are good to go. All right, fantastic, thank you so much. Well, thanks for the invitation to come and talk to you guys today about uh, shark senses. Um, what I wanna talk about briefly is how sharks see the world and how they see it differently than how we see the world. Now, all of you are familiar with the five basic human senses, right? Each of you can name the five senses, right? So if you count them out, you've got sight, and you've got smell, you've got taste, and you have touch, and you have hearing. And this is how we perceive the world around us through these different senses. Well, sharks have all of those same senses. They have everything that we have, but they have a couple more that we don't have, a couple other ways to sense the world around them. And so if you look at a shark, if you look at shark senses, guess what? They have sight, they have smell, and they have taste, and they have touch, and they have hearing just like us, but they also have a couple other things. They also have electroreception that enables them to detect electric fields, and they have a lateral line that enables them to detect water movement. And we're gonna talk about each of these senses uh, and some of them more briefly than, than others, all right? Now, you'll notice that a lot of these senses are clustered around the head. Think of it this way, all your senses are around your head, your eyes, your nose, your ears, your mouth, all of this stuff is around your head. And with a shark, it's much the same way. A lot of their senses are clustered around their head. And what I think is particularly interesting is asking how do sharks with really weird and different shaped heads perceive the world, all right? If you're a normal looking person, we're used to seeing the world with our forward looking eyes, but sharks have their eyes on the sides of their head. And if you think of something like a hammerhead shark, there you have eyes way off on the ends of the head the nostrils spread way far apart from each other, how do they see the world differently than how we see it with their senses so spread out in space? Well, hammerheads are a fun species because they are truly bizarre in terms of their head shape. And we can compare how a hammerhead sees the world to how other sharks see the world. At the top, you'll see just a black nose shark. There's a common species down here in Florida and if you look on the left side of the screen, you can see they have a typical sort of pointy nose. That's what they look like from the top. In the middle is the bonnethead shark. That's another common species here in South Florida. And it's the hammerhead with the least amount of head expansion, just a little bit of, of width of the head. And uh, on the bottom, you can see a, a scalped hammerhead shark. And this hammerhead, again, a broad head, as you're looking down on it, this is what you typically think of when you think of a, a hammerhead shark, all right? And so with so many different weird head shapes and their senses spread out very differently among the different head shapes, how do the different sharks see the world around them? Well, we're gonna go through a few of these senses and, and talk about the abilities of sharks to, uh, to perceive the world. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is the sense of smell. Now this is a picture, a close up picture of one nostril on a hammerhead shark. And you can see that uh, you can see the eye on the edge of the screen there. And then that dark slit in the middle, 
that's where the water comes into the nose and it goes over the nose so the shark can smell. Now, what's different about the, uh, the hammerheads is that if you look at how far apart their nostrils are and you compare it to a normal pointy nose shark, these two sharks are the same size, you know, 60 centimeters total length, but the one on the left is a sandbar shark. You can see how the two nostrils are, uh, are relatively close together. And you compare that to the hammerhead shark on the right, you see how the two nostrils are quite far apart. So why do you think there's a big advantage to that? Why do you think the hammerheads have such a, a widely spaced head? Why do you think the, the, uh, the nostrils are so, so far apart? Well, one of the reasons might be to give them better directional sensitivity. They can tell which way the odor is. So let's say you're walking down the street, all right? You're walking down the street and you smell, mmm, I smell donuts. Huh, where are they? I can smell them, but I don't know if they're this way or this way down the street, all right? It's hard for us to tell the difference because our two nostrils are very close together. You contrast that to a hammerhead shark whose nostrils are way far apart. As that shark is swimming, he can smell something and he would smell fish. Mmm, I smell fish. And because the odor is stronger on this side, he can turn that way and find the fish, all right? So a big wide head with widely spaced nostrils might give the hammerheads an advantage when it comes to finding uh, different prey items, all right? So that might be one thing that will be really advantageous for the hammerhead to have. Another thing to consider is how low a concentration can you go? How, how, how uh, weak of an odorant are these sharks able to detect? And to do this, we use a technique known as an electro-olfactogram. And what you do is you take the animal, the shark or the stingray, you, uh, you anesthetize it so it's, it's unconscious, it's still alive and well, it's doing just fine. Uh, and then you stick a little tube up their nose. And what you do is uh, here we have a lemon shark that's knocked out and you stick a little tube up the nose like that and you pass water, constantly flowing water over that tube. And then you stick a recording electrode right up against the, uh, the sensory cells in the nose. And then when we pass different odors across there, we record the response from the nose and say, can you detect it at this concentration? How about half of that concentration? How about half of that? How about half of that? And keep cutting the concentration lower and lower and lower to see how low the sharks can actually detect. And it turns out these sharks are super smellers. They can detect less than a part per billion. And so to put that into perspective, let me get my little sample here, and we're gonna go over and do a little demonstration. So hopefully you can see this. All right, so here I am by a swimming pool. Can you see the swimming pool? I hope you can see the pool. Yes, so yep, we can see the pool. Yeah, you can see the pool. All right, this is just a backyard swimming pool. This is my backyard swimming pool. And in this swimming pool, there are in excess of a billion drops of water. All right, now a drop is just a little tiny droplet like this. All right, a little tiny drop like that. One tiny drop like that. All right, see that drop? One drop like that in that whole pool, flip. And the shark would be able to detect that tiny amount of uh, liquid in this whole pool, even though that diffuses out and becomes um, uh, evenly mixed throughout the whole, uh, whole pool, all right? And so one drop out of an entire pool like this, and the shark would be able to detect it. That's a really super sense. They can detect parts less than one part per billion when it comes to odors. And so when it comes to uh, um, odors in the water, they could detect maybe a single drop of blood from a fish, and it wouldn't take much to, uh, to stimulate the sharks and let them know that they can smell that, okay? Sharks have a really, really good sense of smell, much better than ours. Well, there's another sense that sharks have, um, vision, just like us, right? And we can ask the question about the hammerheads with the big, widely spaced eyes. How do they see the world any differently? Well, their eyes are looking in two different directions. And it's not unlike something like this. You've got this strange camera with a lens on the front 
and a lens on the back. So now it can look in two different directions simultaneously. Okay, forward looking and backward looking at the same time. That's what the shark is doing uh, as well. And so what we're able to do is ask the shark, what do you see around you? And we use a technique uh, known as an electroretinogram this time. And it's the uh, exact same thing where you are taking the shark, you anesthetize it, and then you flash a little uh, beam of light around the eye. And you move that beam of light around the eye. And you say, can you see it now? Can you see it now? Can you see it now? As we move that beam of light all the way around the eye and uh, measure, and we determine that it's the hammerhead sharks, and the hammerheads in particular, have a really good sense of vision. They can see almost all the way around their head. They can see everything on top and everything underneath all the way around. And they can see from way back here, all the way around, almost completely back here. They're missing about uh, a narrow band, about 28 degrees behind their head where they can't see. But they can see almost everything else. They have a really good sense of uh, vision uh, all around. Now you'll notice that there's also an area um, in front of the head here where they, uh, where they can't see. That's this uh, blind area outlined in red here. And so the hammerheads do have a blind spot right smack in front of their nose where they can't see anything. But once they get a little bit farther away, that's when they can start to see everything else uh, around them. And to sort of put this into perspective, I want you to watch this little video. Let's see if this plays for you. New rules. Nobody, I repeat, nobody makes a move without my okay. I am the Panama Canal, baby. From now on, everything flows through me. Huh? What do you do? What do you do? I can't see it. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Fishtail, but that's... Uh, that's Will Smith um, hanging a spoon on the nose of a hammerhead. And the hammerhead, since it's right smack in the middle of his head, he can't see where that spoon is. All right. This movie actually got it right. Uh, good for them. Um, and so vision. Sharks can see not only um, all around them like that, but they also can see in really low light as well. Very low light vision. Um, they can basically see just by the light of the stars. Don't even need moonlight to see. Just the light of the stars is enough for them to see around in the, uh, in the ocean. Well, this is what it would look like as the shark is swimming. You can see everything except for what's grayed out there in a sort of gray triangle. So everything else that shark can see as it's waving its head back and forth. And it's just that grayed out triangle that, uh, that it, it's not able to see. All right. All right. So they have a good sense of smell. They can see everything around them. They have a good sense of vision. And it's not like they have poor eyesight, you know, they have pretty good eyesight uh, as well. The other sense that I want to talk about is something that we don't have. We can guess what it's like. It's called the lateral line. And you can think of it as distant touch. There are lots of little tubes all over the head of the shark and also along the body of the shark that inform it about um, uh, movement, water movement. And the, what you can do to, to envision this Next time you're in your pool or in your bathtub, take your hand underwater and you have little tiny hairs on your hands, on your arms like this, right? Little tiny hairs on your arms. Just wave a little bit of water like this. All right, you're gonna wave the water, it's gonna brush over, it's gonna move the little hairs on your arms and your hairs are gonna move back and forth. And it's going to tell you, hey, wait a second, I felt that, all right? Your hand didn't touch, all right? You just moved the water and the water moved the hairs. And that was enough for you to know that there was something over here that was moving the water. That's the, how the lateral line works. It's distant touch. It informs you from a distance what's, uh, what's been happening, all right? And so sharks have a really good lateral line system. It runs all over their head and along the length of the body as well and informs them about the, uh, the movement of water all around them. They also have the ability to hear. Now, when it comes to hearing, there are two little pores on the top of the head in a shark. Those are the endolymphatic pores. Don't worry about the name, endolymphatic pores. And they lead down into the inner ears. Now, sharks don't have external ears like us. They're, they're very smooth and streamlined, but they have the two little pores on the top of the head that lead down to the inner ears inside their head. And that what, that's what may enable them to detect uh, sound, okay, through these, through these two little pores on the top of their heads. Now, I just wanted to throw this out real quick. This is a picture of a shark. Um, laid out and you can see this line. Do you see this line running along the middle of the body like that? I'm gonna highlight it here. 
That's the lateral line. That's what you would see in, uh, in a shark. And you see lateral lines in all fishes. It's not just sharks, but it gives them this distant touch, this ability to detect um, water movement uh, from a distance. And uh, if you were just take a section like that, you would see that the lateral line is, whoops, sorry, just underneath the uh, surface of the skin. I need you to move over here for just a second, please. All right, just like that. Okay, little dot right there. So it's just underneath the surface of the skin and that's what enables them to detect these water movements. And I'm not gonna bother you too much with this. This is just showing that the shark can detect whether the uh, water is moving the hairs one way or moving the hairs the other way. And it uh, encodes that information and sends that to the brain. So the shark knows the water's moving this way, the water's moving that way. Suffice it to say, that's all you need to say, uh, get out of this, uh, this diagram. All right. Super sense of smell, great sense of vision. Uh, they can hear, they, they, they can detect water movement without even being touched. Um, there's another sense that I wanna talk about. And uh, that's, whoops, here, electroreception. One of the senses we don't have. This is how sharks detect electric fields in their environment, all right? Sharks have special senses that enable them to detect really, really minute electric fields. And all living organisms produce an electric field when they are in the water, all right? And so when you go swimming, you produce an electric field around your body. A little fish, a little crab, a little shrimp, you name it. Everything out there is producing an electric field around its body all the time. And the sharks have a special electro sense that enables them to detect that uh, electric field. And if you were to look on the head of a shark, you can see all these little tiny dots, all these little tiny pores, all right? Those are the electroreceptors. That's what enables the shark to, uh, to detect these electric fields. And if you were to take a little uh, cut away to see what's underneath, underneath those pores, there are tubes that are filled with a highly conductive jelly material that conducts the electrical signal from the outside environment down into the, uh, into the head. Now I had a cool demonstration set up here demonstrating uh, the conductivity of salt water and fresh water, it's two cups of water here. Uh, but literally, as I was setting up my, uh, my multimeter lead uh, broke off on me. <laughs> so I, I literally, I can't show you my demonstration, I'm afraid. But I was gonna show you how conductive seawater was. And uh, uh, you just have to take my word for it. Seawater is really conductive. It's a great conductor of electricity, all right? And so sharks are able to use their electric sense and we can produce an electric field in the water. And look at this shark as it skims along, it's going to detect the electric field, it's gonna bite at it. And as, as soon as I flip on the electrodes, it's gonna go and go chomp, 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 chomp. And then I'm gonna flip that one off, I'm gonna turn another one on and the shark's gonna bite like crazy, biting away at those electrodes. Flip that one off, flip another one on and the shark will bite like crazy, biting at the electrodes, all right? All it's detecting is the weak electric field in the environment. There's no visual cues there. There's no, old, you know, no older cues there. It's just the electric sense that the sharks are using uh, to detect that. And they can detect electric fields that are exceptionally weak. And so think of this, you know what this is? This is a nine volt battery, all right? Just a regular household nine volt battery. And uh, the distance between the positive and negative leads on this battery here is about a centimeter, all right? So if I were to stick this into water, you would, and I'm not gonna do it now, but if I were to do that, stick that into water, you would be generating an electric field that was at the source about nine volts per centimeter. All right, nine volts per centimeter. That's not a whole lot. It's really, it's not in the grand scheme of things. Um, and what you can do is you can compare that to what the sharks can detect. And the sharks can detect voltages that are not nine volts per centimeter not even a tenth of that, not even a hundredth of that, not even a thousandth of that, not even a millionth of that. Sharks can detect one billionth of a volt per centimeter. That's really, really small. That's, that's so tiny. The way to envision it is take your little nine volt battery and stick one lead in the water in Miami and stick the other lead in the water off approximately Washington DC and somewhere, along the length of that uh, current underwater would be something that the sharks could detect, all right? They would be able to detect the minute amount of voltage that would be produced 
by this battery if I stuck one lead in the water in Miami and one lead in, in uh, about DC, all right? That's a huge distance. That's the sort of scale we're talking about. And that's what enables these sharks to detect these weak electric fields produced by uh, the prey items all the time, all right? So with that, I've talked about how pointy nose sharks uh, have all the same senses as us, how hammerhead sharks have all the same senses as us, but how hammerheads with their really weird head spread those senses out and enable them to detect the world very differently than, uh, than other sharks and, uh, and, and that we would, all right? So with that, I'm gonna stop the sharing, stop the, uh, stop the screen and come back to, uh, to questions and answers and take any questions you might have about how sharks sense the world around them. Cool. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. We have some great questions, and um, yeah, just I didn't know the the distance with the battery. That's amazing. Like like putting that leads and, and seeing examples. So very very cool. All right. So uh, we're going to start off. One of the questions that we get a lot is, do you have a favorite shark? I do. My personal favorite is the scalloped hammerhead. That's the one I showed you in that last picture. And the reason is they are so cute. They're about this big when they're born and they have a big giant head on them and they swim so clumsily. They're like little puppies, you know? Um, but I love them so much because they are such cute little sharks and they have such a great, great head shape that makes them so interesting. Yeah, I think it's amazing. My husband actually, Duncan, that you know, got to film some in Hawaii. And uh, yeah, just that, you know, sometimes baby animals, their head, they have to grow into their head and it's, it's really, they're, they're amazing. So great. We had um, Claudia, age 10, ask, how have shark senses evolved over time? Which is, a, I think, a pretty cool question. That's, that's a great question, Claudia. What's interesting is a lot of these senses have been around uh, since even before the sharks. All right, so the sharks inherited things like vision, things like hearing, all of these other uh, uh, senses. And the sharks have basically had a long time to refine them. Sharks have been on this planet for in excess of 450 million years. They've been around for a long time, all right? And so they've been living in uh, an ocean environment for a long time, and they've had a great opportunity to get their senses better and better attuned to the point where they work really well now. What's also interesting is some senses like electroreception, sharks have had, um, and it's actually an old, an ancient sensory modality, but a lot of animals have lost it. And so a lot of fishes don't have electroreception. Sharks are one of the few that have actually retained it from a long time ago. So it's not like they evolved it new, it was actually an old sense that they just kept with them while other, other species of fish uh, subsequently lost. All right, and Pascal, age 10, wants to know, I think you kind of talked about this, but is there a species that you would say has the strongest um, senses overall, which I think you kind of probably talked a little bit about. So a lot of the senses are really similar in terms of the absolute threshold sensitivity that you can detect for odors or the, the lowest light level. Those are things that are highly conserved, that are the same for a lot of, sen for a lot of senses. But things like hammerheads, because their sensors, sensory systems are so broadly spaced, it gives them a very different perspective uh, of the world. And so in that sense, it enables them to be uh, extremely successful and, uh, and, and uh, particularly good at, at detecting the world. Yeah, I mean, you really can think of hammerheads, I mean, as like the super powered shark, really, when it comes to the sensory systems. And, and uh, it shows you how important that shape of that head really is. It's not just to make them look cool. It's actually really, really important. So good. All right. So Caitlin asked, can sharks become deaf and blind? I mean, I, I know like you think about Greenland sharks with the parasite and eventually, you know, their uh, vision can be damaged. But what about just do we know if sharks can become deaf and blind? Right, so really the only way to become blind is if you have some sort of trauma to the eye. Um, and under natural conditions, there's no real way for them to get blind other than like you said, the Greenland sharks, for example. Um, and in terms of uh, you know, deaf, the, the only thing that would happen there is if you were to damage the little hair cells in the inner ear that enable them to, uh, to detect sounds. But uh, there's no real natural mechanism to do that. There's nothing in the real world that could actually damage them. 
One thing that we could do is dose them with antibiotics. Uh, some antibiotics would actually kill hair cells. Um, and so that's something that, that could do it. But again, that would, that would never happen in the real world. Yeah, and I think people are always really amazed. We get asked this question a lot, do sharks have ears? And people are genuinely surprised because they don't have this kind of floppy, which would be amusing if they did, but uh, probably wouldn't be very hydrodynamic. So um, sure. yeah, it's, I think it's interesting just for people to realize that sharks actually do have ears and can hear quite well. So very cool. All right, so we have um, Lily and Claudia would like to know if sharks hunt more using electric fields odor or sight, or do they rely on all three fairly equally? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the different senses are useful at, at different things, different distances. And so if you're a shark swimming along on the reef, you might initially smell something. Say, hmm, I smell something, maybe it's over here. And you swim over in that direction. And as you get closer and closer, you might be able to see something you know, uh, flashing as it buries in the sand. And you saw something, you go over there. And then as you get closer, you need to use your electrosense to find that, that little fish that buried under the sand, all right? And so they're relying on different senses as they get closer and closer to their prey items. And so one is not more important than another. Certainly, they're all very important in helping the shark to, uh, to eventually find their prey. And they're all very strong and very, very incredible. I always tell the kids, like, there's no vending machines, restaurants. These animals have to find their own food in the ocean. So these super powered senses are really, really important. All right, so we have a couple people um, asking how far away, I think maybe if you guys joined a little bit late because he did this amazing demonstration, I would say watch this video again, um, is how far away can they smell? Uh, it's a very common question. We get asked miles, you know, if a drop of right. blood, 100 miles away, and can you tell right, us right. about that? Sure. So uh, the, I think the important question is how low a concentration can they detect? All right, so they can detect one part per billion. Uh, and in some, with some stimuli, it's even less than that, one part per 10 billion, all right? So it's really, really a minute concentration. The problem is if it were just dropped in and diffused out, all right, um, they could detect that in, in the span of maybe uh, a few meters, basically, all right? A few meters away, that's not very far. But the currents in the ocean don't just sit there and diffuse out. Currents can entrain and move that odor long distances and keep that odor pretty intact over uh, long distances. And so odors can actually be detected from quite a ways away as they're being moved long distances. And so it's, uh, uh, it, it's highly variable. Still water, not particularly far, but in, in moving water, that, wa that odor can be transported a long distance. People know the answer. All right. Um, so this is another one, and I guess it kind of ties into senses. Matthew, age seven, would like to know if sharks sleep. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, sadly, Matthew, I don't have an answer for you. I, I wish I did. Um, we, we don't have a lot of data on, on sharks' brain activity. So when you go to sleep, basically your brain shuts off for the night, and that's how you're able to rest, right? We don't have any data on what sharks do uh, during the day or during the night. We, we think that what's happening is they are continuing to work all, all the time. They don't really go to sleep, but we, we don't have enough data on it. Hopefully you can answer that for me, Matthew, because I, I don't know. Yeah, and I think a lot of the questions we've had over when we're talked about, we've talked about deep sea sharks and, and rare species and scientists, we, we just don't know the answers. There's so much information about these animals uh, as much as we do know, there is, you know, uh, so much more that we just don't know. There's so many different species. The, ha the ocean is a really big place. So I think it's exciting for all the students watching that these are questions. These are opportunities for you to still explore if you're interested. Um, you know, go to places people haven't been before. You can still explore the ocean and answer some of these questions that we just don't know, or it depends on the species. It isn't applied to every single type of shark, and that's really interesting. All right, and to, let's see. Ah, okay, so this is really interesting. Um, Michelle wants to know if they can detect such a small signal, um, how will wind turbines, will that affect um, migration patterns in sharks? 
That's a great question. And that's something that I've actually studied by, by incredible coincidence. Um, and you're right. So what happens is these wind turbines and these offshore power generators have to um, rely on these underwater cables to bring the electricity that they generate back onto land, back onto the grid so we can use it. And so you have these large underwater cables that are carrying huge currents and uh, they set up whopping big magnetic fields around these cables. And a shark that swims through that magnetic field would be able to detect that field. And we've had videos of sharks coming along and biting at the cables underwater. Uh, we've had videos of sharks coming and turning away from the cables. And we've also had videos of sharks just ignoring them completely and just swimming right over them. And so um, it's, it's a great question. Yes, there is definitely the potential for these, these uh, offshore uh, installations to affect the migration patterns. But what I would say is that these sharks, they're, they're multimodal. They rely on a bunch of different senses. It's not just one thing. So if one sense says, wow, there's something really unusual here, but they're looking around, it's, I don't see anything, I don't smell anything, just in my electro sense is telling me something, I think I'm still gonna keep going. Um, so far, we haven't seen any major disruptions uh, in, the, um, in the, uh, the movements, but I think it's really an interesting question, something we need to keep our, uh, our eyes out for going forward. Yeah. Yeah, and this kind of goes back to um, the kind of talk about evolving senses. Um, and I know hammerheads are one of the more recent sharks. So has, is there any evidence that um, within the last hundred years or so, Michael wants to know that the scientific, uh, that senses have been improving in that kind of short span? Or are we looking at something a much longer time scale? Yeah, we are definitely looking at something over a much longer time scale. Um, over uh, literally millions of years. And so, like you said, the hammerheads are relatively recent sharks. They arrived on the scene maybe about 20 to 25 million years ago, all right? But that still misses out 95% of the evolutionary history of sharks. Sharks have been around for like 450 million years, all right? And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of refinement of the senses over that long a span to the point where they're really quite good at what they do, really quite good at, uh, at detecting the, uh, the world around them. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Again, it, you know, we talked about is no vending machines, no, uh, which are far more dangerous than sharks, as we all know, uh, but no restaurants, no cafeterias, mom's not making them a snack, you know, so yeah, it just it really emphasizes how important these senses are. Um, we've had a couple of people ask why you decided to work with sharks. What made you so interested? So ever since I was a little kid, I was interested. I was about four or five years old. And I said, wow, I used to love watching like Jacques Cousteau specials or, or Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and things like that. And anytime they did anything with sharks, that was the, the most interesting. And so I always wanted to do it. And it was strange because I was born in a small rural farming community in Southern Ontario, Canada, way far away from any ocean but uh, that's what I wanted to do. And so I actually did it. And now I'm, I'm delighted that I, uh, I got to basically do my, my childhood dream and, and work with sharks every day. And do you have um, something that you found has both been the most interesting thing you've learned while studying sharks? No, it's probably a tough you one. Know, I don't know what's, what's most, there's so many good things. I, you know, it's hard to pick out one thing that I find most interesting. I think one of the things that I find so much fun is their ability to detect these electric fields in the environment, because that's a sense that's so foreign to us. We don't, we can't do that. We can't detect electric fields, but they have this very rich electrosensory world around them that enables them to, uh, you know, detect little fish here, little crabs here as they're swimming along. They have a whole different way of perceiving the world. And I think that's probably one of the things that I find uh, the most interesting. Yeah, and another one is, so you've obviously looked at the black tip migrations and, and we've seen footage of the hammerheads cruising through. Is that, I mean, that must be, what is that like to see? I mean, is that ultimately what you're hoping to see? And, and is that, that's the hammerhead using those senses to capture, you know, and isolate. And it might look easy because there's loads of prey, but, safety in numbers too. So, you know, what are right. you looking at with that, actually witnessing that, what are you learning about their sensory systems by seeing those predations? It's, 
it's really interesting. When you're looking down from above, you can see the hammerhead cruising and see all the black tips in the water. And you say, why doesn't he get them? He's so close. He must be, you know, right there. He should be able to detect them. But when you turn it around and you jump in the water and you look around, you can't see very far necessarily, right? And so it's, it's not the same as us looking down from above, the sort of bird's eye view. Um, when you're in the fish world, in the fish eye view of the world, you might not be able to uh, detect nearly as, uh, as far. And so when we see these hammerheads thinking or getting so close, what we think is so close to the sharks, um, they're actually not really detecting them until they're fairly close. And then they see them, then they smell them, then they you know, detect them electrically. And so I think that's a different perspective. You know, looking from above is one thing, you know, from air looking down, but looking from underwater, looking from the shark's perspective, that changes how you, how you perceive the world around you. And I think that's worth uh, people doing as well. Yeah, it's, it's very cool. Um, all right, Victoria, age 10, wants to know if sharks have, because we've talked about the senses, obviously eyes and ears and nose, but do they have a spot that's most sensitive on, on their body? Uh, I think it's probably because people hear like for sharks coming in, they've got, you've got to hit something or, or do something, but um, right. is there a particular area, a sensory sort of organ that is most sensitive on these animals? You know, if you're going to um, do anything to a shark, uh, punch it on the nose or in the eye would be the best. And there's a couple reasons for that. The eyes are really sensitive. They don't like to be disturbed, of course. Uh, and the nose is where all the electroreceptors, the, the snout, right, the, in front of the, the face, that's where all the electroreceptors are. And those are very sensitive to any sort of disturbance, any sort of physical disturbance, um, like, a, like a punch on the snout or something. Um, and so in terms of sensitivity, you know, there's, there's the, the, um, the lateral line, the skin detectors, and the electroreceptors all in the snout there. If you give them a punch there, a little, you know, uh, punch on the snout, that would be probably the most sensitive spot on a shark. Um, another question was, we've had a couple people actually ask is, what is, you know, you have, obviously it looks like you had sharks in the lab um, and, you know, lots of equipment. So what is the most challenging part of, of studying shark senses? You know, the most challenging part is dealing with the paperwork. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the biggest problem. The sharks themselves are great. Um, you can go out and catch the sharks. They're, they're easy to handle. Um, you know, I think when I, when I talk to physicians, I tell them, you surgeons, you have it easy. You have an anesthesiologist, you have a nurse, you just have to do one thing. I have to do it all. I have to anesthetize the animal. I have to get all my equipment ready. I have to do the little, uh, stick the electrode up the nose or whatever. Um, you know, so one person has to do everything. And so we have to be very uh, adept at a wide variety of skills. And I think that's one of the uh, most challenging parts is, uh, is doing these experiments. Um, it's just actually getting all the little bits and pieces uh, together. And I think it's really good for, for students who are interested in marine science on these conversations. And, and I've mentioned this before is, um, what you see in photos and videos, and that's the easy stuff. We don't see the long hours, the prep, the logistics, the permitting, um, you know, and, and even if you're talking about studying in the wild, are the sharks going to be there? I mean, the, mig the migration, for example, you don't have a specific date and time that they all show up. You have a range of time and you hope, but um, to study things, you're talking about helicopters and planes and, and scientific equipment. So I think it's really important for students to realize that um, you know, there's a lot that goes into this kind of work and research that you just do not see, um, which is, it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, don't forget that there is, there is a lot of challenges with this work. And, and uh, so the people doing it are, are really passionate and putting in a lot of time and effort and to, to learn more about these animals. So, all right. Well, I think with our last question, we're going to ask you um, if there was one thing that you wish everyone knew about sharks, what would that be? Oh my, one thing I wish everyone knew. I think I would probably tell people that in general, sharks are really pretty skittish and you are lucky if you get to see a shark in the water. So I've had people tell me after I've shown them videos of thousands of black tips migrating down here and huge numbers along the beach, they'd say, I'm terrified to get in the water. I don't want to get anywhere near them. And I keep telling them, 
you won't, you can't. You, we try to get close to them and we can't. These sharks are so skittish. As soon as we get in the water, they bolt and they, they move away from us. And so in general, sharks are uh, much more likely to stay away from you. And if you happen to see one, count yourself lucky and say, wow, I had this great encounter today. And uh, I think if more people had that attitude towards sharks, that's what they knew. And I think the sharks would be in much better shape all around. Absolutely. And I'm just, I'm going to sneak one last question. And this one just came in. Um, Freya, age 10, would like to know um, if females have heightened senses while they're pregnant. Which is pretty That's a great question. A really great question. Don't, we don't know. But what I can say is that males have heightened senses during the mating season. And we know this from their electrosensors. What happens is during the mating season, as male levels of uh, hormones are circulating through the body, they are actually better attuned at detecting the electric signals of the females. So if, like it was done on stingrays. A female stingray can bury under the sand, right? And the male stingray can swim by and detect her electric field and come in and mate with her. And so in the mating season, the electrosense is more highly attuned in the male to enable them to detect the electric signals of those females. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much to everybody who joined us. All the wonderful questions. Um, again, if you guys, we did our best to answer as many as possible. Um, if you have some other questions, you can please reach out to us. I can connect you. We'll make sure we'll do our best to, to get those answered. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Fajera, for taking your time uh, and sharing all this really amazing information with us today. You guys, if you missed some of the demonstrations earlier on, I definitely recommend this video will be on YouTube shortly. So I definitely re recommend checking it out because I think it's, you'll really enjoy this and very, very interesting stuff about sharks. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you again for your time today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.